So I figured I'd watch this because uh, do you guys remember that uh, the whole thing, uh, you hear about this? Threads. Remember that? Remember how popular that was for like almost a whole day? Ever since ChatGPT came out, the tech landscape hasn't been the same. As if suddenly hit by a burst of enthusiasm or a FOMO, mm -hmm. the titans of the tech world have rapidly assembled oh, a massive Dynamics. AI departments and begun working. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, and basically everyone else has embarked on a race to finally outdo one another and come out as the supreme victor. Their goal? Simple. Create the next big thing. The next YouTube, the next Google, the uh, next Instagram. They have funneled an unprecedented amount of resources into research, laboratories, compensation, marketing, hardware, software, and everything else required to bring these remarkable innovations to market. The promise of AI's potential was simply too enticing to ignore. Self-evolving algorithms, human like I don't feel like there's been any application of AI aside from making AI-generated waifus, which, to be honest, are getting really good. Like, it's actually crazy how good they're getting. Um, like, I, I see these uh, accounts of these, like, AI waifus, and, like, there's guys commenting under the pictures. They're like, I love you. Please move to Turkey. You know, like, they don't even know. They have no idea. You want one. Who doesn't? Yes, of course. Machines, unbelievable automation. But, but that is so far the only, uh, the only value that I feel like uh, the average internet user is getting out of AI is AI waifus, at least for now. Most importantly, unthinkable riches and control. Mm -hmm. The reality, though, is that FOMO has blinded these giants to a simple yet glaring truth. They have already lost AI, and pouring hundreds of billions into a lost battle isn't going to change anything. Let me well, I think it's about making something that's good. Like, a really good example of this is, like, eBay used to be bigger than Amazon. And then Amazon just created a better product over time, and then Amazon became better than eBay. It's the same thing as like YouTube didn't come out the first day YouTube came out. It wasn't immediately the biggest video sharing platform, but over time, because it had a better tool for communities to grow, then people started to use it. It was the same as Facebook. Face MySpace used to be the main platform. Everybody used MySpace. Then Facebook came out and it was a better platform and people liked it more and they moved over. So it's not really about being first matters a lot. But it's not the most important thing. Blank. Whoa. What's In the this? stock market, there is a famous saying. Past performance not is indicator. not an indicator of future results. AKA, just because a stock has been performing well, does not mean that it will continue to perform well. Most investors say this tongue in cheek. They know that it's true, but they continue to invest in companies and funds largely because they have performed well in the past. Companies are even more susceptible to this logical fallacy as they have been directly rewarded for such behavior in the past. The only reason they got so big in the first place is because they gambled big on their hero products, whether yeah. that's the iPhone or Google or WhatsApp. They went against the grain and bet it all. Remember how much criticism Facebook received for spending 19 billion on WhatsApp back in 2014? Yeah, WhatsApp is so fucking massive. It's huge around the world. Like, I think that it's like the number one used app in a lot of places. This gamble ended up paying off, but let's not forget what it was, a gamble. Each time yeah. these companies win a gamble, they're more inclined to think that they can dominate any industry they want if they just spend enough money. I don't think it's necessarily being inclined to believe that you can dominate an industry, but more so that every single time that a potential industry pops up, all of these companies try to plant their flag on whatever moon that just was invented. So, like, if it's new crypto stuff, then they're trying to put their flag on that moon. If it's new, uh, you know, NFT stuff, they're trying to do that. It's the same as, like, Twitter. Remember how Twitter had, like, that hexagon thing for, like, NFT owners? And, like, now the only thing that, like, nobody uses that anymore. But it's because they want to feel like they are keeping up with things. Because the truth is, like... Every once in a while, like with WhatsApp, it works. Yeah, they're just simply trying to play the law of averages. 
if we keep batting, we'll eventually hit a home run. And I think that's a healthy thing. And to be honest, like, oh, the, the big tech company's doing this, bro. This is the fucking uh, mission statement of venture capitalism. Take 100 shots, hit with one of them, make up the money from all the other 99. And if you don't make the money back, that's totally fine. Write it off as a loss on your taxes, and you're still going to be okay. So, yeah, that's just how it is. It's great for innovation, yes. But this notion is fundamentally flawed, okay. and you don't have to look much further than Meta. After making decabillion dollar bets with WhatsApp and Instagram... The reason why Meta didn't work is because Meta had no functional value for the end user. WhatsApp has a functional value for the end user that allows the end user to do something that they want to do better. Instagram has a functional value for the end user that allows the end user to do something that they were going to do, but better. Meta and the metaverse, this was not something that the community wanted. This is not something that the public wants. This is something that is being pushed top down for the community to, or not, I keep saying community, but like for people on the internet to embrace and take part in. Why do companies want people to take part in the metaverse? Because the metaverse is a world where they are God. They can choose everything. They can decide everything. They have total autonomy over everything that you do. So of course they're going to want you to effectively sign up to their new world so they can control you in the new world like it's it, it, an ironic new world order but the thing is that this is not something that is an intrinsic value to the individual like the individual does not see value in being controlled by facebook or being controlled by google they don't care about this this doesn't improve their life it doesn't help them find big titty cat girls any better it doesn't help them hook up with girls any better so what's the point? Graham and seeing them pay off, Zuckerberg felt confident to start betting in the hundreds of billions with the metaverse. I respected Zuckerberg for doing this, by the way. I did, especially, bro, a captain who's willing to go down with his ship, you love to see it. I could respect it, yeah. Even though I think it's completely fucking stupid. And I think we all remember how that turned out. Mm -hmm. But the metaverse is merely their most publicized failure. Meta's list of yeah. failures is far larger than just that. Take Poke, for example. In the early 2010s... But it doesn't matter how many failures they have because WhatsApp probably outweighs all of those failures. That's the thing. Is that WhatsApp is probably such a massive, tremendous success globally that it doesn't even matter. You can fail a thousand times. And all you have to do is win once and that's it. And Instagram, yeah, look at Instagram. And yeah, I mean, I think the metaverse is something that will happen, but the reason why the metaverse isn't happening is because it's not being presented to the consumer as a value add on their life. And that's why these things aren't popular. This is why like some streams aren't popular. It's because like the person wants to stream a game and they want to act a certain way on stream but the value isn't there for the user. And if the value isn't there for the user, then everything else falls apart. How does WhatsApp even generate money? I don't know. I have no idea how it generates money. And after seeing how well Snapchat was doing and failing to acquire Snapchat, Facebook decided to launch a clone called Poke. Poke. The premise seemed straightforward. Leverage their vast user base and existing infrastructure to launch a rival app, which should have been a slam. And this is also like, this is the same exact thing, right? Snapchat, it, it was the, so like 2020, I would say like 2019, 2020, the big thing was uh, like Snapchat and like, uh, not Snapchat, but uh, like uh, TikTok. So like in 2019, 2020, Everybody was trying to do a fucking run on the bank, you know, a gold rush for who can make the best TikTok. But the truth is that TikTok is the best TikTok. It has a better algorithm. It has better user retention. And the content is just better. And also young kids use it. And you know why young kids use TikTok? It's because it is not Facebook. It's because it is not YouTube. You can't just, you're not going to figure out a way to convince a 12-year-old to think Facebook is cool again.
Like, do you guys remember whenever you were 12? Like, you want to do the new thing. You want to do the cool new thing. Like, we liked MySpace because it was new and different. We liked Facebook because it was new and different. That's what kids like to do. They, they don't want to do the same thing that their parents did. And dunk against Snapchat. But Poke would end up flopping so hard that Facebook would end up deleting Poke from the App Store without even publicly mentioning yeah. it. Jump forward a few years and Zuckerberg would start betting on space, the apparent next big thing. He was going to build this grand drone internet until he quietly shut down that as well. The metaverse gamble followed as did bets on AI and most recently the Threads endeavor. I mean, with Threads, their daily- Threads user base has plummeted more than 80%. Meta's app ended July with just 8 million daily active users. That's because Threads has no value. See, there actually isn't a lot of people who are clamoring to be micromanaged by nerds that live in San Francisco and told what they can and can't say by a fucking, uh, some sort of uh, committee of people that don't like them. Nobody actually gives a fuck about this. Nobody actually cares. There's celebrities and popular users that think that, oh, well, you know, this is the right thing that I have to say. But the truth is that, no, people don't want to be fucking micromanaged by Mark Zuckerberg. People don't want Jeff Bezos to tell them what they can and can't say. People want to say whatever the fuck they want in general. And they don't want anybody to take that away from them. So the moment that Twitter did that, why the fuck would anybody else go over to any other platform? Why would somebody, yeah, why would somebody sign up, go out of their way to get censored? The active users was literally down over 80% within just a month of launch. Yeah, With there was no, and also like, again, there was no other value to it. Like, and also a big thing, threads didn't allow porn. How can they be so stupid? Why are they so stupid? Didn't they see what happened to Tumblr? Bro, you remember that? Remember whenever they banned Tumblr porn? And remember how good it used to be? It was done. Nobody wanted to use the website for anything other than that. Just throw an NSFW filter over there and call it a Yeah, sure. Twitter is for porn for normal people. Yes, exactly. It's completely normal. 99% of streamers, content creators, and influencers don't like Twitter and disagree with everything the company does, but still use it. I don't disagree with everything Twitter does. I think Twitter's great. I think it's Twitter's totally fine. There are some, th like, I mean, there are things that, that, that it does that I don't like. But overall, I'm a Twitter enjoyer. Yes. I enjoy Twitter. It doesn't matter. You're part of the 1%. I sure I can be. Like, I don't care. And do you know why people use Twitter? It's because the people are on Twitter. Content creators and celebrities are going to want to go on the platform that everybody else is on. They don't want to go and make their own platform because then it makes them look like losers if they're not getting anybody interacting with their posts. They're not making any money. Their entire business model and their what they're selling is influence. And so if you're selling influence, how the fuck are you making any money whenever you're not influencing people? So of course people are gonna stay on Twitter because Twitter's where the users are. That's all there is to it. Each and every one of these products, Zuckerberg was trying to create the next big thing. Of course. The next big social media, the next big space project, the next big VR project, yep. and the next big AI project. That's right. But each and every time, they miserably failed. This isn't to say that the sector itself failed though. Snapchat has 400 million- See, it doesn't matter how many times he fails. It doesn't matter, he can fail a million times. He's only got to succeed once. And then it pays off everything. Yep, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Most people don't succeed tremendously at their first business or their first business venture. So they keep trying and you just keep trying and you just keep trying and then you win. Winning looks a lot like losing until you win. And users, Twitter has 370 million users. Starlink is doing great and someone will eventually win VR. It's mm -hmm. simply that that someone wasn't Facebook. The reality is that Facebook has only launched one next big thing product in their entire history, and that was their original product, Facebook. They had two. Well, Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. So there you go. Successful acquisitions, Instagram and WhatsApp. Yep. But that pretty much sums up the entire company. Yeah. Everything else they tried was a complete 
failure. This isn't a jab know. again. Like, I don't even agree with this. I, I don't agree with this conclusion. Guys, they only have three multi-billion dollar companies. There's only three multi- Dude, this guy, dude, they're falling off. <laughs> they only have three multi-billion dollar companies. What is this? Facebook as it's true with all of their peers as well. When was the last time that Google or Apple or Amazon actually launched something that was even comparable to their hero product? Google has already- Uh, Google, last thing. I think, you know what I think Google's best product really is, is their ad program. Uh, and, and their analytical program. I think that's probably their biggest, uh, their biggest value. And then also, of course, like their, uh, their, their, uh, fucking, like their web service, right? Web hosting. But like AWS is is Amazon's biggest thing, as far as far as I know, it's like their biggest thing, uh, and, and also like Google. So like you think about the amount of things that you use Google for, right? You use Google to look things up. Uh, you use Google for uh, maps. Uh, what el what else do we use Google for? Uh, Google for trends as well. Google for search. Google for porn. Uh, Google for translate. Google for Gmail. Gmail is one, Gmail, again, by the way, Gmail is one of the best email programs. It's better than Hotmail. It's better than Yahoo. It's better than AOL. It's an actually very good program. Uh, it has, it has Google Gmail has probably more and like more savvy customer and user protections than almost any other, uh, any other program. Yeah, Google Docs as well. The name is synonymous with internet searching. Exactly. It's a band-aid, but it's actually a fucking, uh, it's actually a company, you know? Exactly. Or Xerox or something like that. Google Drive. Yeah, think about that. It, it, Google is huge. It's massively fucking successful. Arguably had the most number of successful products, but at this point, it's been over a decade since they launched a winner as well. The reason is obvious. It's simply ridiculously hard to replicate the success of something like Facebook or YouTube, even for- I think also a big problem is that how many massive, like, websites have really come out in the last 10 years? Have launched in the last 10 years that were tremendously transformative. TikTok, TikTok and Snapchat. And I think actually Snapchat predates 10 years. Chat GPT, OnlyFans. And also OnlyFans, uh, well, actually, I heard OnlyFans made like, a, what was it, like $53 billion in revenue, something like that? It was something crazy. Yeah, it's insane. Patreon, yeah. Twitch, Twitch was around 10 years ago. CEO paid himself $300 million in bonuses. Good for him. Companies that have already done it once or twice. Nice. This brings us back to the original statement. Past performance is not an indicator of future results. Just because Facebook launched a successful social media 20 years ago and Google launched a successful search engine 25 years ago yeah. does not mean that they have a better chance of winning AI today. Oh, well, well, the point that I was making though is like all of these companies, like everybody keeps taking shots, but most people miss. Like 99% of everything is a miss. And like we have like three or maybe four big websites that have come out in the last 10 years. In fact, I would actually argue that it leaves them worse off. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. I feel like whenever this happens, uh, I feel like this is like a gotcha roll or something. Everyone is so quick to point out all of the advantages enjoyed by these tech giants. They command the finest engineers, possess unparalleled infrastructure, possess seemingly limitless capital, and boast extensive reach among other assets. But rarely do people consider these companies a biggest shortfall, an incomprehensible amount of baggage. Aside from Wall Street and Big Pharma, Big Tech is likely the most hated industry in the world. People big Tech, most hated industry in the world, yeah? But the reason why I think that, <laughs> the, the most hated industries are the ones that people have to interact with the most. Think about it. The medical industry, um, fucking, let, let's see here, pharmacies, because they have to pay for the, the stuff. Uh, uh, fucking big tech because they're using tech products. Oil and gas, but like the gas industry, who, would he, who fucking thinks about that? Other than big pharma? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about it, right? 
is that it seems like the more that the the, that the public has to interact with an industry, the more they hate it. People see them as monopolies with way too much power, control, and influence. Oh, they are. The big tech as massive levels of monopoly, and I think it should be regulated by the government. I know this is an unpopular opinion, uh, but I think that big tech is way too strong and has way too much of an impact on everything uh, to not be regulated. Not to mention the privacy concerns. Only a yeah. vocal minority voiced their concerns about these companies or go as far as ditching WhatsApp. Or the problem with, uh, the problem with, with, with uh, regulation is that like right now, regulation, like, because like now Elon Musk owns like Twitter or X or whatever, right? Now that he owns it, I think that a lot of the conservative people care less about regulation because they feel like he's on their side, if that makes sense. So the problem is that people can't get together and see the ultimate problem down the road with having these massive companies that have no allegiance to any country that just want to make more and more money that just push out fake information or uh things that just make people mad or just whatever they can to make more money right that's their goal is to make more money uh they they can't see the long run in this because they're winning right now so they don't want to stop winning because they're playing an unfair game and it's rigged in their advantage. And then the moment that it's not rigged in their advantage, now we want to talk about regulation. Now it's okay, guys. You know, let's be honest. These companies have too much power. You see what I'm saying? Conservatives weren't complaining for eight years. Well, they were. They were really pissed off. They were pissed off during COVID because they couldn't talk about COVID was fake. There was the January 6th stuff. Uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of conservatives were very, very outspoken about regulating big tech. And then whenever Elon buys Twitter, big fucking surprise, I don't hear about that as much anymore. And you know why? It's because they feel like they're winning right now. But guess what happens? Eventually you lose. And then whenever they do lose and whoever takes over Twitter from Elon in some point in the future or another website comes up that's more popular or something changes that we can't even predict right now, then they're going to be like, oh, I think we need to think about regulation again. It has nothing to do with principle. It has everything to do with power. Gmail, but that isn't to say that everyone else is happy with these platforms and likely the best example of this is with YouTube creators. When a YouTuber starts using too much clickbait or starts selling out too much, only a vocal minority will call them out. Yeah. Everyone else will just be less inclined to watch their next video. When you compound this over months and- I think that a lot of people don't actually give a shit about that, whether it's clickbait or not. I think that they just care about the quality of the content. I think that there is like a, um, a viewer power fantasy that the viewers feel like if you clickbait us, we will stop watching. There is no we. You're not speaking for anybody. You're just a loser. Most people don't give a shit about that stuff. We've clickbaited for years. Nothing's ever happened. Mr. Beast has clickbaited for years. Nothing's ever happened. It's never going to stop working unless the content gets worse. That's it. If you don't click me, oh, I watch your content. Yeah, exactly. Years, that's how you end up with a dead channel. It's the same thing with big tech. People aren't going to ditch Gmail just because Google is notorious for collecting data or implementing anti-consumer friendly policies. But when they eventually get the chance to choose between Bard and ChatGPT, they're going to choose ChatGPT every day of the week. Well, they're only going to choose ChatGPT if ChatGPT is a better product. Like, for example, I think one thing that was really damaging towards like this AI stuff is like whenever the AIs were programmed to not have certain perspectives, like, for example, uh, I think the most popular one was that the AI was not programmed or allowed to make arguments for fossil fuels. I think that the moment that you program in a bias for something like that, the authenticity of it goes into the garbage and people no longer because like you in order to use the AI, you have to believe in the AI, right? It's just common sense. So if you think that the AI is compromised and it will not say certain things, what else will it not say that I don't know about? And that, that shadow of doubt is actually super corrosive to people that want to use this in an authentic way. Faith scaling? Yes. 
It wouldn't say bad things about Fauci. Well, there's a lot of other examples, right? But I think that the, the first example was the uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, I, I just I didn't want to use like the COVID examples or like the Fauci or like the, you know, make jokes about white people versus black people because like they're more political, right? The fossil fuels is kind of cut and dried. And so that's, I think, a big reason why people don't trust it and don't use it. Aren't they all biased or else they'll get like racist or something? I don't know. In fact, I would argue that this bias is the number one reason that otherwise great products don't take off. Take Threads, for example. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest critiques of Threads is that it's just a ripoff of Twitter. But that's quite a funny argument because that was never a showstopper before. Facebook itself wasn't the pioneer in the realm of social media. Does Friendster and MySpace ring a bell? And what about Google? Is there a single thing that they've launched that's not a ripoff? They didn't create search engines or email or video sharing or browsers or- Well, you don't need to invent something completely new. Like for example, like, like the iPhone, the Apple made the iPhone. Literally, iPhone was 2007. It'll be 20 years in four years, and we will still be effectively using iPhones. That is fucking insane. That is absolutely fucking insane. And it's almost impossible to do that. Like, it almost never fucking happens. That's not an iPhone? Yeah, but it's basically an iPhone. iPods got discontinued. iPods got discontinued because iPhone cannibalized iPod smartphones or really anything. They just made things better and that was yeah. enough. Recent products like Threads and Bard, however, appear to be judged more by their perceived lack of originality than by their actual merits. Honestly, this phenomenon- well, It's because the originality is just, I think it's the value. Again, like people get value out of Instagram, people get value out of X or Twitter, people get value out of YouTube, they get value out of TikTok. Threads doesn't provide value, so people don't use threads. What unique value does threads provide that TikTok or Twitter does not provide? Nothing. Phenomenon has more to do with optics than product authenticity. Imagine if threads was a startup. If threads was a startup, the optics would be completely different. Threads would I disagree with that because you can compare that with Mastodon and Blue Sky, which were startups or smaller companies and they were poised as oppositional to Twitter, and they were also similarly, or actually even more unsuccessful than Threads was. ...have been seen as the valiant underdog taking on the once great Twitter that was ruined by Elon no. Musk. But since Threads is from Facebook, people perceive it as, oh, great, greedy Facebook is trying to expand their monopoly into yet another sector, woohoo. You could almost see this playing out in real time. After Threads launched, everyone checked it out just to see what all the hype was about. But no one really resonated with- Well, people, like, uh, Mastodon wasn't new. I know Mastodon wasn't new, but Mastodon was a small up-and-comer company that could be poised against, you know, Twitter as, like, this David and Goliath situation, right? Uh, so, like, it, it fits the narrative that he's trying to paint. Because he's saying that, like, the public mental narrative of these big companies trying to just claim more and more of your real estate on the internet is working against them. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that actually matters as long as the product is good. The product or story. And this is why it's so dangerous for these big tech companies to enter the AI scene. More than likely, they're just gonna burn an extraordinary amount of money and end up losing anyway. In fact, this trend I has- I think it's good that they are entering into the AI scene. I think that having more people try more takes on it is better. And the more people that you have trying to do it, the higher the chances that you're gonna have something good. That's my opinion. And like, for example, it, like you can look at this with video games, right? Is as soon as a video game is in beta, there are like probably a million bugs that the developers never found themselves, right? Because there's like that many more people looking at it. And then whenever a video game goes into like, it gets released, well, then everybody's playing this game. And now there's all kinds of crazy weird metas coming up. Things that the developers never even began to intend, like uh, frame rules. Do you really think that Nintendo planned to have frame rules in the original Super Mario Brothers? Absolutely fucking not. It was just how the game was uh, the game was done. Do you think that like the credits warp glitch in Super Mario World is something that one person could have figured out? Absolutely not. It took an entire community of people working collaboratively in order to arrive at a five minute clear of Super Mario World. 
and I think that this is something that happens all over the world, that happens with everything, is that the more people that you have on something, the more people that are aware and trying to fix something and do something and work towards it, I think the higher the chances that you're going to have a good product. You're going to have something that's great. Already begun with BARD. The common sentiment around BARD is that ChatGPT was the OG revolutionary product and that BARD was just copy-pasted ChatGPT. But this is completely false. Google has been working on AI for longer than OpenAI's entire existence. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, Google probably wasn't as focused as OpenAI, but this is also completely false. In total, OpenAI has raised $11.3 billion, which is an insane amount for a startup. But do you want to guess how much Google has invested into AI? Maybe I would say probably say like 100 to 150 billion. 20 billion? 40 billion? Well, it's actually upwards of 200 billion dollars. More than Google I has literally wow. been investing OpenAI's entire funding into AI every six months for the past decade to come up with BARD. But unfortunately for Google, it looks like BARD is gonna end up as the next Bing while ChatGPT ends up as the next Google. The bottom line is that people have already made up their mind about big tech. So outspending the competition isn't going to allow these companies to come out on top. That's a good point. He's right about that. You can't just simply outspend people and beat them. Like it doesn't matter how much money you have on something. I think that like, you know, you know what a really great example of this is? Overwatch 2 versus Holocure. Who would win? A multi-billion dollar company or one fucking weeb? Well, guess what? Weebs win again. So that's just the truth is because, the, the, again, and the reason why is that the focus at that point is not on creating value for the user. It's on creating value for the company. Uh, it's not even true. You can uh, buy out the company if you're as rich as these companies. I, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying like, yes, if you buy the company, that's a completely different situation. Like we're talking about competition. Like, can you beat the product? Like, well, if you buy the product, yeah, I guess that's beating the product, but like, that's not the conversation. But then what's the solution? Well, the solution is easy. Fang must come to terms with reality. The reality that AI will only yield a limited number of true winners. And statistically speaking, it's highly improbable that the big tech giants will emerge as one of these winners despite their vast resources. I think the problem is that, like, this is just my, my opinion, is I, I think the problem is that these companies look at AI as the end all and be all. Whereas AI should be looked at as a component to a value add that is something greater. Like AI should be part of what they're providing, but it should not just be what they provide, period. And I think that one of the reasons for that is that I think that one of the reasons why AI hasn't really worked for a lot of these companies is because the companies don't present AI in a workable way. Like they don't kind of like, for example, with TikTok and like with Instagram and Snapchat. It's very obvious what you're supposed to do with them, right? Like you're supposed to post pictures on the platform. You're supposed to post short videos on the platform. But with AI... I think that we're actually in a position where a lot of users for AI don't actually know what to do with AI because the product isn't narrowed down. And this is also like a, a parallel to this is with like department stores and different types of like online retailers as well. A lot of them don't have all of the different options of shirts or clothes or whatever, because they know that if they provide the user with 15 different shirts, then the user is going to get what's called choice paralysis, and they're just going to get overwhelmed and not buy any of them. But if you provide three different shirts, then that choice has already been curated, and they're more likely to buy one of those three shirts. So I think that AI is running into a similar problem where because AI is being presented as just this wide canvas, nobody knows what to paint. So I think that as soon as one of these companies finds out a workable tool, because think about how, how popular AI pictures are. They say, make AI big boob picture. Boom, done. Everybody does it, right? 
But the problem is that that hasn't been applied to other situations. Now, the exception to that, I don't know a lot about that. I, I don't like I've taken like one semester of programming. I didn't do well in the class. So like I don't really understand programming very well. However, I feel like programming and like types of, uh, you know, rudimentary design can be kind of used with with AI. And I think that people do try to use that sometimes at least. But I don't know enough about that to like really have an opinion on it. But the, the big boob uh, pictures, I do. So that's, I think, the problem with AI right now is that AI is being presented as this massive fucking canvas and nobody knows what to paint. And the reason why these companies aren't being successful is because the companies don't have a focused way to paint pictures on their canvas of AI. Do you guys see kind of where I'm coming from here? Combine this with the overwhelmingly negative public sentiment against these companies, and it becomes damn near impossible. Almost every single company has a negative sentiment in the public, by the way. Um, Walmart, Target, uh, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, uh, I, I don't know, like Costco. Costco doesn't. Yeah, I guess Costco doesn't. True. Uh, Blizzard. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like Papa John's. <laughs> You know, like there's a lot of I would say like most companies have negative sentiment in uh, in the eyes of the public. Well, for a thing, yeah, every ISP win AI. So should they just sit back and watch as their fortunes crumble thanks to up and coming AI products? Well, of course not. That would be brain dead behavior. But if sitting back is a bad idea and going all in is also a bad idea, what in the world are they supposed to do? Well, easy. Instead of trying to strike gold themselves they should be selling the shovels. This is exactly what NVIDIA has been doing and, I mean, the results speak for themselves. NVIDIA was originally a consumer brand focused on selling GPUs to gamers. They screwed up their PR with gamers when they started embracing cryptocurrency miners. Gamers felt like NVIDIA betrayed them and that NVIDIA was just milking gamers and yada yada yada. When AI started gaining steam, NVIDIA could have easily tried to make their own in-house consumer AI platform. They had all the tech and money to do so, but instead, they chose to bet on something far more consistent and reliable, selling shovels. Now, it doesn't matter to them who wins the AI game. It could be Apple or Google or Facebook or OpenAI or some startup no one has ever heard of. It doesn't matter because they're all using NVIDIA GPUs. Yeah. In this sense, NVIDIA has already won AI and secured their future within the new era without actually having to take the massive gamble of creating the next big thing. The same thing can yeah, be said- Yeah, they just do a good job with what they're already doing. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, I used the 4090 on Starfield last night, it was pretty fucking good. About Microsoft. About 10 years ago, they decided that they were going to And also be NVIDIA, by the way, NVIDIA does such an incredible job with their marketing. Like, the amount of marketing that NVIDIA does, I think blows AMD out of the fucking water. Like, that's really, like, I always hear about NVIDIA, I never hear about AMD. And, like, I remember back in the day, like, this was, like, always, this is my, like, fucking, like, over 10 years ago perspective. Is it like NVIDIA was like very good at like rendering landscapes, but uh, you know, what was it? Uh, AMD was very good at rendering uh, like particles, you know, things like that. And like, I don't even know what it's like now, but like now I feel like all you hear about is NVIDIA. And the reason why is because NVIDIA is always trying to do new things. They're always making some sort of new uh, some new innovation. They're, are, they're always like releasing some new product or announcing some new product or something. A back-end company focused on supporting great solutions as opposed to creating great solutions. The result? Well, after mm -hmm. 17 years of stagnation, Microsoft would nearly 7x within four years. Now, of course, supporting these solutions won't be as lucrative as creating them, but the probability of success is also more like 90% mm -hmm. as opposed to one in a million. Also, for the record, supporting AI is already insanely lucrative. Google seems to be recognizing this paradigm shift as they've started focusing more on expanding their cloud business rather than- By the way, I feel like one of the reasons why, I don't know, like maybe I don't, I like I genuinely don't know this well enough, but like my layman perspective on why Nvidia stock probably went down a lot is because of the massive global silicon chip shortage that affected every single car manufacturer 
and everything. I don't think it was a sentiment with gamers. I think that it was just simply they could not sell their product. Like, that's why. It, I don't think it had anything to do with, like, because the thing is, I don't think people were mad at NVIDIA for these chip farmers. I mean, some people were, but, like, I think most people were just mad at the chip farmers or the the, the crypto farmers. Because I saw, like, remember the, those videos that, like, these guys would make of, like, you know, all those, like, 3070... Like, remember that thing? It was, like, in this, like, super air conditioning white room. And then, like, people tried to, like, reverse dox this guy of where he was at. I never saw any hate for NVIDIA there. I just saw hate for the people that were doing it. So I think that that, sh that, that, that stock price was 100% because of the chip shortage. I don't think it had a lot to do with uh, gamer sentiment. NVIDIA sold pallets to the miners directly. Fuck them. What's wrong with that? Am I the only person that doesn't see a problem with that? These are people that are willing to pay for your product and you're selling them your product. The problem wasn't that they were selling the product. The problem was that other people weren't able to buy the product because nobody would have had a problem with Nvidia selling the product to these Bitcoin miners if they were able to buy a graphics card themselves. And why were they not able to buy a graphics card themselves? Because of the chip shortage. So the chip shortage, in my opinion, as a layman, I could be wrong, was the real reason. So they're launching consumer-centric products. Facebook, on the other hand, is still going mm -hmm. all out on gambles, whether that's good. the metaverse, AI, or threats. Good, good, good. It's the same case with many of the other companies at the top as well, as they've all been blinded by FOMO. And all they're gonna have to show for it in five or 10 years is a slew of forgotten products and hundreds of billions of dollars less in the bank. The problem is that much of big tech is trying to buy naked calls on AI, when the smarter solution- <sighs> Trying to think. Didn't Discord begin as a video game? What was the thing that became- was it Slack? It was Slack. Yeah, sorry, that's what I was trying to remember. I, I, I could have been wrong about that. Okay, so, basically, they- yeah, Slack- so, so Slack, I know nobody here probably has a job, but like, that's why we're watching this at 2 in the morning. But, like, Slack is something that's used for working professionals very often. Uh, it's kind of like just a communication platform. Uh, basically, Slack was used, uh, was originally just a video game. And a after a while, they realized that the chat program that was part of that video game was actually really great. And that chat program became Slack. So, I actually don't think that taking shots and missing is necessarily a bad thing. Because sometimes whenever you take a shot and you miss... That can still help inform your next shot. That can still help empower you to make the next good decision, even though the first bad decision was bad. But sometimes you make a bad decision and that enables you to make a good decision in the future. You see what I'm saying? So I was just trying, like I'm, I'm using that as an example, like with Slack. For some reason, I thought it was Discord. ...is to just sell puts by offering the foundational tools and support necessary for the AI landscape to flourish and to laugh all the way to the bank. But... That's just what I think. If you'd like to learn about yeah. how AI got to this point, check out this video. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Somebody else brought up a really good point in chat, and they said Fortnite PvE. Fortnite was originally a survival game. It was originally a PvE game, and whenever the game came out, you had to actually buy the game in order to access the PvE content. And the Battle Royale part of Fortnite was free. So I actually always respect any of these companies trying to take shots and do things that are new and do anything that's new. Because I think that in the process of doing these new things, you achieve something that sometimes you would have never actually been able to do uh, initially. So yeah, it's like oftentimes like innovation like that. What I'm saying is like innovation is sometimes, uh, there can be a serendipitous nature of innovation where things, you're, you're trying to innovate one thing but you learn something or there's some sort of interaction that leads you in a completely different direction. Nowhere where you were trying to go originally, but this new thing is so much better. Happenstance. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's a breakthrough. Yeah, there's a breakthrough. Exactly. Uh, and that's what happened, ironically, with uh, making classic WoW work. I'll link you guys this video. I think this is a great video. I don't agree with the idea that big tech is like wrong and like that people hate big tech. I think that it's just all about the use case. That's all it is. It's all about the use case and it's all about the user value.
And the user value is what matters the most. And that's why a lot of these companies fail, is that there is no user value for something like, a, what do you call it? Like threads, there's no user value for something like, a, what was the other one he, he mentioned? I, I forgot, like the Bard, right? There's no user value for Metaverse. So that's why these, these, these things fail. It's because these things are generated, and it, it is kind of an ironic thing, right? And I think it could actually be part of why big companies are hard. It's harder for them to innovate because these things are generated and made based off of their profit potential versus their user benefit. So because they're being made by this massive company, that's very profit defined and very profit motivated all companies are but especially with these companies then i think that they probably wouldn't take certain chances or create certain products that might have a better user case for or a use case for the user just because uh they don't need to right they don't want to a lot of companies for now have banned chat gpt uh because stupid people stupid people put sensitive data in them I don't know about that. I have no idea. Let's see. I'll read a few comments about this. The way technology has improved in the last five years is insane. Only issues are policies and how they can get ahead of laws and the government. Well, the good thing is the government, people that work at the government. So in inside of the Senate and the House of Representatives, collectively, let's say 300 people. It's a bit less, I think. Um, how many of those people do you think don't know how to use Internet? Or sorry, don't know how to use email? Because I think there's at least 10. Yeah, there's at least probably 10, or maybe, you guys think 70%, right? Less than 5%? Yeah, but like, if you asked every senator to explain what chat GPT is, what AI is, what stable diffusion is, how TikTok works, do you think that they would be able to do that? Probably not. And that's the problem. I think 0% of them know stable diffusion. Yeah. To be fair, when you ask a young person, they would also know nothing. Yes, but the young person is not deciding policy for the country. Like, I wouldn't expect a plumber to know what stable diffusion is. But I would expect somebody who's in the government to know what it is. But yeah, um, I'll read a few comments. On this. I think this is a uh, next big thing is regulating those darn mega co tech companies just like any other damn utility. All right, there we go. Where's the EU regulators at? Yep, true. I'm glad this guy also agrees with me. Thank God. I'll link the video one more time, then we'll watch the uh, classic wild deaths again. You should not be in office or in politics. Oh, I really hate this line of thinking, by the way. I think this line of thinking is really stupid. I, I know that people are, like, really into circle jerking about how term, uh, like, what's it called? Like, term limits and, like, term, uh, like, limits. I don't know what else. That, that, that's the term, right? I was thinking of another way to explain it. But, like, term limits for... Uh, for people that are in government, I, I don't agree with this. I don't care if somebody's 80 years old. I don't care if they're 60 years old. If they're doing a good job, I want them to stay in that job because they're doing a good job. I don't want to arbitrarily fire them after a period of time. That doesn't make sense. But they're not? Well, then isn't that the problem? But, 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 but isn't that the problem, though? The point is to get rid of corruption? So you think people that have been in there, like... So you think Bernie Sanders is more corrupt than somebody, some, some like random, uh, let's see, uh, young politician recently in trouble with corruption. Uh, I don't know, like, I'd have to think of somebody else contradicting yourself. No, I'm not. Just because you don't understand what I'm saying doesn't mean that I'm contradicting myself. Uh, George Santos. Yeah. Yeah. Some Matt Gates or somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this idea that like, oh, well, you're just going to get more corrupt the longer you're in government. That's just bullshit. 100% you have examples of Glitch McConnell, who's feeding off the government test and can't comprehend what's going on. He's having seizures. He shouldn't be. Mitch McConnell shouldn't should be nowhere near signing any bills for anything if he's having seizures. Like straight up. Like, what are we talking about? Of course not. Yeah, if this is frying his brain, then absolutely not. I don't think anyone should be able to sit in a position of power indefinitely. Why? Like, what's what's the logic of that? Power corrupts, needs to be limited. It is limited. That's why they run for re-election. 